<clears throat> Greetings everyone and welcome to another edition of In Studio. I'm your host Ted Perch and this morning we're here at Healy Guitars with Trevor Healy playing one of his custom made guitars, a Healy guitar. So you told me earlier uh, that there was a story. This is one of your this is one of your instruments. Sure. And you you told me that there was a story behind this guitar. So right. So a customer brought a guitar case in one day, and I hadn't worked with them at all before, mm -hmm. so it was kind of an interesting spot to start a relationship. Yeah. I opened the case, and he told me that the neck, uh, which is this neck was from a Bay State guitar, which Bay State guitars were made in the late 1800s to early 1900s in Boston. Oh, really? And so we dated this neck to be around the 1917 to 1922 And how, how, did, how do you do that? There's actually a serial Cer number serial stamp numbers, right. in the end of the headstock. Right. Um, and the person that now owns the rights to that name mm -hmm. has a registry on the line right, with sure. all the information. So somebody had cut this neck off of just, the guitar. Just sawed it off? Which was a guitar <laughs> similar to this. Yeah. Um, either sawed it off or the body had broken. Right. So we don't know the story, but he bought the guitar at a tag sale mm -hmm. and it was attached to an electric guitar body that looked <laughs> like it had been cut from a mahogany headboard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it had a DeArmond pickup, which was a, you know, 1960s acoustic yeah. guitar pickup for like a jazz guitar. Uh, so it was a really interesting guitar on its own, a very Pro folk. Probably some guy in a, like you wanted to, pl wanted to play, didn't have the money to buy something, right. so he started put putting something together. Putting something together And himself. you couldn't have had a better neck. The neck yeah. is very, very straight for being that old. Right. So, we discussed would it actually work to put this neck back on an acoustic guitar mm -hmm. and for about a year we went back and forth on whether or not to do it mm -hmm. both having hesitations about money or sure. is it even possible mm -hmm. so this heel was not there it was sawn flat off 
um, oh. to be attached to this electric guitar. Oh. So the first thing that I said I had to do was figure out if I can even get a heel built back on here with a dovetail joint that would join to a body. Right. So once I had figured out how to do that, I started making the body, even though I didn't finish this. Mm -hmm. um, so figured out that I could make it work. Um, this is ivory binding on the edge. So yeah. this guitar, similar to Madagascar Rosewood, can't be shipped out of the country um, just because of that. Even ivory. now? Even, even now. now. Wow. Um, so we decided to make, and all of this inlay and everything is original to the yeah. day state. Mm -hmm. So we decided to make a parlor size guitar, and a parlor guitar is one that would have been played in the parlor in the early 1900s. Right, they're softer, a little quieter. Yeah, and probably strung originally with uh, nylon strings mm -hmm. or gut strings. Right. And this is a little bit smaller than what the registry said the size was, mm -hmm. but it's a size that I had already built and was comfortable right. making. And all of the the way that it joins together made sense for this size. Right, right. So it's a 12 fret to the body, neck joint, and most modern guitars are 14 fret, which gives you a little bit more access to upper right. frets. So this is very much something that you would, people make these today, but it's referring to the age that it was made in. Right. So the back and sides are mahogany. That's just beautiful. And this was stuff that I bought from another guitar maker. It's, it's nice. It's a nice honey colored. Yeah. It's not dark. Right. It's beautiful. So it's possible that this was, this neck was a, a more honeyed color, but mm -hmm. through age and stuff. And you can see somebody either played a lot right here. There's still some original discoloration or maybe where the, it was sitting in the case. Yeah. So we put a guitar together. Uh, I used faux ivory, which is ivoroid plastic binding. Uh, Brazilian rosewood for the bridge, which matches the wood on the headstock. Mm -hmm. And on the, the end pin here. And just created a guitar as authentic to maybe the size and sound as I could right. come up with. And it's... So how, but, so how is it that he had the neck and now you have the whole guitar? He lent it to me for the... He lent it to you? Yeah. Just for today? Just for today. Really? Yeah. Oh. And he plays some blues and old time music yeah. and really loves it. Couldn't be happier. It's but we put new frets in and the neck is glued on with hide glue. That's the other part of it is that mm -hmm. a lot of the construction was with the hot hide glue. Right. Um, animal glue that is what they would have used right. back then. Well, thank you for loaning Trevor the guitar today because it's a, it's a supreme instrument and it has a beautiful tone as, as you heard at the beginning of the program as he was playing. So we're here to talk to Trevor about his, his guitar making, how he came to, into the business and uh, how, how a custom guitar gets made. We have uh, some demonstrations and some, and, some, and some other things to show you as the program goes along. First of all, welcome, Trevor. Thanks for being on the program. Thanks for inviting me to be here. Thanks for coming to the shop. So how, how did you get into uh, make, making guitars or music? or What's your story? Sure. So when I was a teenager, I started really getting into the idea of, of making things, whether it was uh, pottery working with metal, mm -hmm. took a lot of classes outside of school, learning all sorts of craft. And then decided I wanted to start incorporating some of the things into musical ideas. Um, so I made some junk instruments and, you know, taking a tin can and throwing a piece of wood oh, yeah, as we a made neck and yeah, yeah. just being able to amplify things, right. kind of experimenting with that. No. Your f your family is musical. You were yep. you were in a musical household. Yep. Both my parents uh, play guitar, banjo. My dad plays fiddle and mandolin. As wow. Well. And they've had a, or up until recently, 
had an old time string band called the um, Ash Creek String Band. No okay. kidding. Yeah. Mm. Started in Terrific. Bridgeport, Connecticut. So that's quite that's quite a um, uh, an atmosphere to be brought up in. I mean, absolutely. It, it doesn't surprise me that you would be leaning towards uh, music and instruments and. Yeah, I suppose I took a little while to get really serious about it, mm -hmm. but um, it was never pushed on me or anything. Right. It was just very natural. Uh, learned a lot of the first guitar chords from my parents. Mm -hmm. Just kind of took it from there. What what type of music did they play? String band. What type of music? Yeah, so old time gospel string band oh, music, wow. yeah. a little bluegrass in uh -huh. there, um, and then eventually sort of um, incorporating. Modern folk elements, uh, Sean Colvin and oh all yeah, those sorts yeah, of, uh, John Gorka too. Oh yeah, well he's a great instrumentalist as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yeah, as, as, wonderful as a guitar player. Yeah. So I'd be going to uh, coffee houses and stuff. Like yeah, that. cool. So then, so so you began to tinker with musical instruments and so forth, and yeah, what was the progression after that? So once I saw um, some handmade instruments from somebody around my age, that's when I really uh, decided that I wanted to try and go do this. I want to do this. I want to do it. My friend Ryan Welcome uh, showed me some instruments that he'd made hmm. at a school in Arizona called Roberto Ben School of Luthery. And uh, six months later, I was there yeah. doing the same course that he did, building an acoustic and an electric guitar. Yeah. Now the term luthery, it's a it's a medieval term, and it I I think it that it, it sort of came from uh, the lute. Yeah, the people lute who made lutes and the violin, um, basically any stringed any instrument. Any stringed instrument. Yeah, and uh, the legacy of luthiers is, you know, yeah, it goes very far back, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of modern guitar makers have just called themselves a builder or a guitar maker, but luthery has kind of come back into the war. It's, it, it, well that's, that's, that's what it is. It truly shows that, I mean, it is a craft. Mm -hmm. There's study behind it. It's not guitar tech. Yeah. You know. So it's in, in your beginning studying luthery, uh, how, how long is it, how, how long a process is it to, from you walk in the door and what, what, do you, what are you taught? Yeah, so walking in the door, um, it was basically, these are your options for wood. Mm -hmm. uh, they limited things somewhat so that teaching 30 people wouldn't be no. impossible. Um, you choose mahogany, spruce, cedar, rosewood, uh, typical guitar woods, mm -hmm. and uh, three different guitar shapes. Actually, it was actually only two. Mm -hmm. And then um, start cutting. I mean, it, from it was like a morning lesson of a theory of why and how instruments work and how they're put together. Right. And then everybody goes out and watches somebody start cutting. And you you just you just follow what follow they're doing. That the instructions. Step. Yeah, there are probably about you know anywhere from three to five steps a day. Yeah. And over the course of three months three, four months, mm -hmm. including spraying and finishing um, yeah. all the final setup. So really just blocks of wood being cut uh, from raw lumber. Now, uh, the, the tops of the guitars are traditionally spruce. Yep. Does it ha because it has a, the acoustic qualities that are... Yeah, and the structure of it. Um, the grain, yeah. The grain. It's called quarter sawn, where the grain is as vertical as it possibly can right. be. Yep. Um, and then there's grades to that sure. top. So this is a triple A guitar grade. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's four A above this. Really? And then master grade. Oh, um, Segovia. This was like one of the best pieces of wood I ever picked out. It's I mean, it's and just it's, beautiful. Um, so structurally, you've got a piece of wood that was book matched. Yeah. So this is the two halves mm -hmm. of the, the individual piece. Quarter sawn, glued down the center, and there's all sorts of interior bracing. Right. Well, and we, but there's we'll lots of structure, um, strength, 
both laterally and longitudinally. Yeah, and we'll be able to show, yeah. uh, show that on one of the pieces that you're working on later on. Um, so you, so you're in Arizona, yep. and that's your first, uh, first, uh, first, first guitar, first guitar, yeah. your first school, and yeah. then you went off on your own to. Well, th I was in college. I went to Skidmore College mm -hmm. for to study classical guitar and music and anthropology. And so you're a, obviously you're a player as well because the introductory song tune was from uh, John Fahey. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so. I've been playing and it all just kind of, all the, the making of instruments uh, from other objects, bringing it over to guitar. Mm -hmm. I really, that's what it, my whole life was about and still is, playing and building. And so you studied further though, you went to yeah, California? Then I, yep, then, uh, or New well York actually, City. correct, I went to, after I finished Skidmore, um, Let's see. So after Roberto Venn, mm -hmm. I went back to Skidmore to finish up undergraduate right. studies and built a classical guitar in the jewelry making studio. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that we were discussing earlier. That's the one that didn't turn out quite as well. Yeah. It turns out it's quite a challenge to do this on your own without. Because I asked Trevor. An instructor. In all of his experience making guitars, was there, a, was there an instrument that just was a lemon? just because it turned out that way. Yeah, unfortunately, you learn a lot after you leave school. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a whole book, but it's pretty difficult to mm -hmm. nail it the way that you did with 30 other people around plus five instructors. Right, to tell you, no, not that, this, not exactly. that. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so I really wanted to learn more, but also needed a job. So I looked up uh, a couple different guitar makers, and but my main interest was looking for Roger Sadowski mm -hmm. um, to build electric guitars. Now Roger Sadowski is, to the audience, who is Roger Sadowski? He is a guitar maker in New York City who studied acoustic guitar making with Augie LaPrinzi in New Jersey, mm -hmm. had his own repair shop um, in Pennsylvania, and then moved to New York did repair work and modifications to people's instruments right. for lots of studio musicians. Oh, yeah. So his clientele was very wide and uh, known. Professionals. Very, yeah, lots of professional clientele. So I admired his instruments from afar. I had never played one until I walked into the shop yeah. looking for work. And he had just let somebody go, you know, whatever reason, I don't remember, mm -hmm. it didn't work out. So there was a bench space available, and I worked for three or four days for free. Mm -hmm. as sure. A, sort of a trial. Let's run. see what you can do, kid. Yeah, uh, which was fine. Um, and at the end of the week, I kind of said, so what do you think? Am I going to come in on Monday or mm -hmm. what? And uh, I worked there for five years. Yeah and fairly quickly moved into um, assembling instruments, mm -hmm. uh, which was, we'd have an instrument in various stages throughout the show. And I might have put the frets in and yeah. done a little finish work. Uh, Frank Robbins was doing all the neck finishing, really. And then you grab all the pieces from various points and assemble them. The so there are so, so everybody has a specialty. Yeah, one there were lots of specialties, and then three or four of us that were putting stuff right. together. So one guy makes the neck, one guy makes the bridge, mm -hmm. uh, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Huh. And and uh, when we moved to Brooklyn, I became the production manager within the first year. Wow. Um, that was within the first two years of working. You're a talented kid. There were a lot of people that After were moving a year, on, yeah. and I ended up being <laughs> a senior in a senior position fairly quickly. Yeah, you're the last man standing. This was right around 9/11, and a lot of things changed. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, so it was. I was very fortunate, and um, I learned a tremendous amount. Sure, it, it, you c couldn't help but learn in a in a. Uh, situation like that right. where it's so rich with experience exactly. and, and the craft going on. 
Yeah. So yeah. Roger had a, a a lot of experience in a lot of different things, and he focused on high-end electric guitars and basses. Yeah. With exceptional fretwork and electronics. Yeah. And the wood was always top-notch. Mm -hmm. You know, there were never any duds. No, there's a lot of. <laughs> they never got to finish if it was. There's a there's a, there's some controversy about the the uh, source of some of the woods that guitar makers use. Sure. Particularly for a, a specific company that has been. Yeah. Involved with illegal trade of uh, alleged illegal trade. Right. Well, there's a lot of wood that for years and years and years people exploited its use, mm -hmm. um, not paying any attention to that it would be around for 50 years or 100 years. Mm -hmm. or, and now the the amount of that wood is dwindling it's, and the CITES treaty, which limits what you can bring and yeah. import, um, really limited that wood supply. Right. And what Gibson guitars ended up uh, doing was apparently getting a bad uh, sourcing right. Madagascar rosewood and whatever that deal was was illegal yeah deemed right. by the FBI right. and other people. Right, right. Whether or not it was, I have no idea. Yeah, that's but that that's would clear. Madagascar rosewood replaced Brazilian rosewood mm -hmm. as kind of the primary fretboard wood. Really? Hmm. And Indian rosewood has been there for years. Martin guitars and everybody's used that. Yeah. And it's still a wonderful wood to use. Oh yeah. And is not limited, but probably will be. So from New York you moved to California. Yeah, my wife um, decided to go to grad school for fine art, and we moved to San Francisco, mm -hmm. and she studied at CCA, um, which at the time was, and it still is, but it used to be called California College of Arts and Crafts, right. and they dropped the C, mm -hmm. but she was studying textiles. Yeah. And so it was a really great place to be, and I found a repair person named Gary Brower through Roger mm -hmm. on his recommendation, and another electric bass maker named Joe Zahn. Mm -hmm. And I worked with both of them the whole time I was there. Longer with Gary, but I was doing a lot of the same things in Joe's shop that I did it. You were building guitars, repairing building, them? Building electric basses mm -hmm. with Joe and repairing all sorts of guitars with Gary Brower. Now, you were, now some of your clients were high-end musicians. Yeah, we the worked bigs. with Metallica and uh -huh. Joe Satriani and a lot of, you know, guitar players, guitar players. Yeah, yeah. That must be, that must be kind of exciting in a way. It really was. I there, mean, you'd get an instrument and then you'd have three days to get it ready for, a, you know, 90-day tour or whatever. Yeah. And there'd be a row of eight guitars. Now, did any of the guys ever come in? Most yeah. of the time it was a runner uh, who, you know, these guys that we knew quite well. Right. Gary got to go to the Metallica headquarters for a Halloween party. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there were a lot of good stories and lots of compliments to Gary on right. the crew and everything. Cool. Yeah. So from but yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> some of the guys never come in. Joe Satriani <coughs> always brought his own stuff in. Yeah. Neil Sean would come in and hang out and play Journey. <laughs> that's, every, that's every guitar player's dream. It was you know? pretty cool. Um, and then there was hundreds and hundreds of people that played in San Francisco. Oh, or God, getting yes. guitars shipped in, and you hear tons of stories from all sorts of different Yeah, people. it's a, from the 60s, San Francisco, Berkeley area, yeah. all the, the Grateful Dead and all the bands. I mean, mu yep. music is... Music is part of the part of that whole the soul of San Francisco. Exactly. In a way. Since Gary got to work on a lot of Jerry's stuff, doing repairs and modifications. Yeah. People would send him projects that other people built. Yeah. But to to kind of go over it and make sure that it was spot on. Now I, I I'm thinking that each each player, a pr professional player, say, has uh, some. Um, Qualifications about, particularly the fretboard and the neckboard. Sure. It has to fit their hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, specifically to Metallica, um, 
Tim Frick, who is my coworker, he would reshape mm. every bass neck that came in. Yeah. I don't know if that's uh, something I should be talking about, but that's something that we did. Um, well, no. It, yeah, we would customize an instrument specific to that client. Right. And it's something that I still do today. I might reshape a neck to match the person's favorite neck. Right. And as long as all the thicknesses and widths are correct, right. I can make a little template for various points on the neck and, and carve it down. Right. Well, all our, our hands are all different sizes all different. and shapes. Our fingers are short, long, and, yeah. you know, the, and how you're able to curve your fingers over the neck, sometimes that makes a real difference yeah. in, in your comfort level exactly. and your ability to really Yeah, and that's what you can't necessarily get from buying something, yeah. hanging yeah. a guitar somewhere. And even if you picked it up there, you know, bringing it in here, um, lots and lots of adjustments can be made. Yeah. Switching out hardware and fret wiring. All right. I, had, I, I was t telling you earlier that I have a Gibson J50 that when I bought it years and years ago, the, the, the action always seemed a little stiff to me. Well, my fingers are, you know, the strength of my hand and so forth. But the, and I, had it, I did have it altered uh, in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, my daughter was using it. and. Uh, the guy, I don't know exactly what he did, but it's easier to play now. Sure. Yeah, um, all things about the guitar can be, they're all related. So yeah. if you want a specific thing with the neck, whether it's straight or has a little relief in it, the curvature right. of the neck, you can then lower the saddle and mm -hmm. the bridge to compensate for those changes in yeah. height. So there's a lot of adjustability. So now you're here in the Pioneer Valley, yep. where music is part of the culture here. Uh, exactly. So when, what, how long have you been here in your studio? I've been here for three years, and basically started looking around uh, once my wife and I moved back to the East Coast, mm -hmm. looking for a place to live that was somewhere in between our families in Connecticut and Vermont. Mm -hmm. and had both come here at various times. Lauren's sister went to Smith, mm -hmm. and I had played in a band that played at the Flywheel on various occasions. Can, can you plug the band? Uh, that was called The Way Down. Uh -huh. We don't exist anymore, oh. but I still play with some of the guys. Well, just in case there's some Way Down fans out there that, yeah. you know. They'll see it. They'll see it, yeah. yeah. They'll hear this and say, whoa. Yeah, so um, started looking around for workspaces yeah before really even thinking about work mm -hmm. I just wanted to try and have a space where I could make things even if I had to have another job right um, because I did come here with no real friend base right or that's right clientele base mm -hmm. so started the shop with a few tools and a few benches and a just of, kind of a lot of faith took it from there yeah, yeah. Uh, but we found the space in Eastwork yeah that was the right price and the right amount of space right uh, and it just felt like this building was really professionally run mm -hmm. um, and even though I'm a little bit hidden it, it helps me get work done hidden <laughs> the first time I tried to find this place I I, ha I was at the other end of the building, exactly. and I, this building is huge, and it's a long walk a long down walk. here. And I got Almost to the end. Almost a tenth of a mile. I got to the end of the hall, and I'm standing there looking at this wall, saying, "Where am I? <laughs> where where, where is this I guy go? located?" Yeah. And then out of the corner of my eye, I, s I saw the door. And I said, "Oh, okay." Yeah. So if you're ever walking around the basement of Eastwork, you can find yeah. me in the far. West the end. farthest reaches of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> Far west end. There's a Far great west end. Place. Yeah. Um, now you also repair guitars. I see all the guitars here that are sure. that are they're in for repair. Yep. Yeah, I do everything from setup guitars, which basically means making all those adjustments mm -hmm. to make it play better for you. Um, Refretting <coughs> instruments, so actually removing. The frets from the fretboard to either change the size or fix um, the height, 
the height or the the wear mm -hmm. in them yeah. because they're steel, but the strings are steel as well, and they after a while after a while out. they wear each other out. Yeah. Um, Regluing bridges that are coming off. Yeah. Electronics works a whole gamut. So you work on guitars, banjos. Banjos, basses, mandolins. Ukuleles. Ukuleles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but not violins or you know, no, the, no the upper boat instrument. No boat instrument. What we're going to do now is uh, Trevor's going to take us around the studio, and we're going to he's going to show us part of the process that goes into making a guitar. It, it doesn't come out of an egg looking like that. It's constructed, and there's various stages. And he's going to explain how this works and show us some of the uh, the tools and the forms that are involved. And then after that, we'll talk a bit more. And then we're going to have him play another song on, on the way out. Now we're here at the workbench. And Trevor has, uh, this, has laid out some of the uh, components that go into a guitar. And he's going to explain, actually, what it all is. Sure. So we'll start with the top. And this is Adirondack spruce. I've already cut the perimeter out, thickness the top to what it would be on mm -hmm. a finished instrument minus whatever sanding right. happens at the end. The inlay is in there for the rosette, which is two fiber strips. It's wood, but uh, a pre-laminated part. Right. Uh, so I don't have to go through that trouble. But the, the center seam, it's already joined. And, and, there's, and there's, these are more or less standard shapes. Right. So this would be the parlor size, similar to the one that we played. Yeah. Um, and this is the orchestra model. OM for short, which Martin designed in the around the 1930s, right? Based on a customer's interest in having that 14 fret, right, to the body. And the body is bigger. It's a 15 inch wide body. Yeah. This is roughly 13 inches. Mm -hmm. So the sizes that I offer go through various stages of widths from 13 to 16. You never do any jumbos. Jumbo is uh, the small jumbo is the 16 inch, oh, and that's okay. big enough for me at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So these are the uh, this is the, this is the top, and um, now uh, this is the right. So we've got two backs right. here. This one's for a maple guitar, Ooh. and this is for an Indian rosewood guitar. Wow. Yes. And we were talking about shapes. This is the what I call the HM, and it's two. Martin's triple O guitar. Right. And this is the the back for the top that we've got here. So now this is all uh, the reinforcing. Exploded. Yeah, reinforcing the material based on the thickness. Um, right. It's roughly ninety thousandths thick at the back. It's mm -hmm. under an eighth of an inch. The bracing is similar to the top. We've got quarter sawn spruce braces. And there's a slight curvature here as well. Yeah, I was wondering how that. I was wondering how that happens. I've got a, a radius dish that allows me to first sand uh, in that arch. And this is if if you cut out a sphere. Yeah. This is 50 feet of that sphere mm -hmm. in a three foot circle. So it gets sanded in after I've roughly planed it. Right. And then I take a either a small hand plane or a large one and actually plane that bottom surface to accept the glue. Right. Um, and then once they're glued down, I would then go through a process of, you know, smoothing it up. Smoothing these and shaping them into a, a triangular shape, right. which we've got here. Why is having the back curved important? A lot of it is uh, to give, to build in uh, a structure that's stronger than a flat piece of wood. Right. Uh -huh. So anything with a radius being pressed on this way is inherently stronger. Right. And it uh -huh. allows for a little bit allows for a little bit more volume yeah. on the interior because your bottom creating is creating more space. More space. Yeah. Um, and then reflection wise, getting sound to move right. out of mm -hmm. the box. Cool. Yes. And the the 
all of these parts together built at a light weight um, allow for something that's really resonant yes, and full yeah. sounding. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, uh, an import guitar made of plywood doesn't necessarily have Won't sound like an that. acoustic quality. No. Um, so this is a dreadnought or a, what's called a slope shoulder, like the Gibson J45. Yeah. Uh, so this is a future J45 at a less deep right. than a Gibson. Yeah. So it's probably going to be more for uh, finger style. Yeah. But this is one that is just being built oh, to beautiful. have something around. It's beautiful already. Yeah, it's really, it's really there. And so, similar the wood inlay around the center. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we hear so from the from the backs and the and the top. Mm -hmm. we, um, the, the, the side pieces are, are are then are then prepared. Yeah. So. so the sides get bent in this mold or form, and now that's, these are, that's the finished shape. So yeah, this is roughly you. the finished shape that comes out of here. Mm -hmm. And there's a heating blanket, and this is the the heating element with steel slats that. Yeah support the, the piece of wood while it's in there. And this gets just above 300 degrees. Yeah. And once the wood is wetted, it steams out the remaining water and moisture. And it does change the, the, the structure of the wood. Yeah, so you are stretches. physically kind of stretching it. Yeah. And once it's bone dry, you've got something that's holding its shape. Yeah. And will maintain that. Forever. Forever. More or less. More or less. Especially now, once the top and back are glued on. Right, right. Now, how long does that take? How long does that forming process take? You have to, once you get it in the form. And so I work on one side at a time in that mold. Yeah. And that is about a 30 minute really? set up and let it go kind okay. of a thing. You kind of slowly stretch these, the, supports that keep it here. I don't have them handy right, right now. Right. Um, and work that over the course of a couple minutes on each end. Right. Mm -hmm. You could spray more water if you needed to. I can do it very quickly. Yeah. But it tends to bounce back a little quicker. Right. If you don't take it mm -hmm. a right, little bit right. slow. But yeah, one side, I wouldn't take it out in that half an hour, but that's the process. Yeah. Basically. You just have to let it rest. Right. Or set. Yep. Yeah. So sometimes I leave it overnight, kind of plan the day to have that at the end of the day. Um, or, you know, just move on and do the right. next thing. Now this, these pieces are the, uh, the um, that's the binding that the goes binding, around the, the word, Yes. And you, these, these are shaped in the same, the same shape as the, uh, same shape as the guitar. Uh, the edge is routed to accept that, mm -hmm. and that's glued into place. Yeah. And it protects the edge of the soundboard and also as a decorative element. Yeah. So then the next step is... Once you've got sides bent, is the, uh, we've got an exterior mold that helps maintain that shape. Yeah. There's kerfing that gets glued in, that's and this is a piece that adds a glue, larger glue surface for the top and back, right. but also helps strengthen, strengthen it. the sides. Yeah, sure. And I've put a few braces in the sides. Some people don't have them at all. They think that the sides should resonate yeah. along with the guitar as well. I find that the stiffer side mm -hmm. actually helps. Now, how long does that, once that's in the form, how long does that rest there? It's in there until I've glued the back and top on. Right. And then I can remove all this. So there's, all no, there's this. no time frame. You just it, not so. necessarily. I think the faster the better, but this has been in a little over a week. Yeah. And the top isn't yet braced. Um, so it's when you get to it. When I get to it, but it'll be within a week or two. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, there's no rule. But, you know, you want to move through the process as quick as you can. I know that sometimes, in my experience, building wooden boats, and you have to steam things. Uh, they have to stay in a mold for a while so that everything dries and mm -hmm. everything sets. But 
you have uh, shortened that that process by doing what you, with the heating blankets. So right. It's like it's accelerated process. Sure. And just like the top and back, this is a book match set of yeah. wood. Mm -hmm. So this is all from the same piece. Yeah. Cut in this direction, you know, as it was flat. Right. And then when they're put in here, the end block and neck block are glued in. Mm -hmm. Keep those pieces right, together. Right. And this adds the structure for the neck to get glued to and there would be right. a dovetail yeah. joint. And here we have, this is for all your air guitar fans. This is, this is a uh, rough uh, cut. Yeah, rough cut neck. neck. So on the interior, there's a truss rod, which allows the neck to be tightened and either put in relief or take out relief, right, yeah. depending on how you true the fretboard. Two graphite strips that are routed in to strengthen up oh, the neck, yeah. allow more stability to combat moisture and things. And that's, <coughs> that's mahogany? This is mahogany. Yeah. I've got an ebony head cap and rear plate. Uh, they're both laminated wood. Right. And this rear laminate is more of an arch top um, yeah. guitar construction, but it's something that I. And then it all gets shaped, sanded, shaped. Sanded and shaped down. to the same size as the fretboard. This one's been slotted already and has binding of the same material on the edge. And the, no, dot. the fretboard is rosewood? Or? This, on this one, it's ebony. Ebony. And a dovetail joint. All right. Now, the frets have to be cut in a, in a specific location. Yep. Yeah. yeah so there's it's a called, bit of math involved. Right. There's definitely math involved, but I have a few templates that yeah. have taken care of that for me. Um, I still end up laying out a lot of things, you know, ruler and pencil. Right. Once these slots are there. Yeah. Uh, I have templates for the width of various different size fretboards right. to for whatever your preference is. And yeah, this whole thing will become much smaller. Yeah. In the end. And once the, all this is done, the uh, the drilling drilling holes for the pegs. Yep. Pegs yeah. and the shape of the heads. Yeah, the other decorative elements, like any inlays on, mm -hmm. the, on the fretboard. Yep. Well, that's uh, that, and so that's it. That's, <laughs> that's how it. it goes together. Sounds very simple, uh, but it's uh, there's a lot of moving parts, and it's a it's a very exacting, artful process. And uh, thank you, Trevor, for go going through with this with us. I, I've good. learned a lot, and I hope our viewers as well have uh, have learned what they need to. I hope our viewers have learned the same as, as, as I have. And I hope that people, when they see the program, um, come down and introduce themselves to you. And there may be lots of guitars in, in, in East Hampton that uh, need repair, and people don't know where to bring them. Sure. You're and welcome you to come down to Healy Guitars. And Healy Guitars has a website, which we'll, uh, we'll put on the end of the program. It's HealyGuitars.com. Yeah. And you can, you can link to him, and you can contact Trevor, and, and, and come on down. Well, we've come to the end of another program. We've been here t today with, at Healy Guitars with uh, Trevor Healy, and he has been talking about his craft of make handmade guitars and some of the processes that go into making a, a guitar. And so from all of us to all of you, I'm Ted Perch. I'm still your host, and we'll see you next time on In Studio. Mm -hmm.